All right, Matthew chapter 6, called this uh, Lessons for Dad from the, uh, the Lord's uh, Prayer. The, uh, kind of just doing a little background reading this week uh, about uh, in uh, Father's and Father's Day, at least, uh, at least in terms of some of the things being written in our own culture. And uh, a couple of articles caught my eye and just the idea that I don't, I don't catch a lot of prime time uh, if it's not sports or, or the news, but uh, uh, the... Uh, you don't have to watch too much network television to find out that uh, uh, there's not really uh, much in the way of a happily married husband and wife couple completely functioning uh, with, with, their, with their kids. Uh, it just uh, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't exist anymore, and quite the opposite is there. If there's a father in a show, according to those that keep up with these things, they're mostly bumblers, abusers, or, or uh, dullards, just pretty much uh, checked out. A Washington Post article noted that there is an increasingly endangered species on modern television, functional merits. They're, uh, they're just not there. And the message, of course, is that, hey, if you don't have a father, heck, you don't even need one. But actually, uh, uh, nothing could be further from the truth. And there's a wealth of social science data to support that from familyfacts.org. Uh, they say that loving fathers bring a vital dose of love, security, and stability to their wives and children, and, uh, and they make a huge difference. Patrick Fagan of the Heritage Foundation said that in 1950, 12 out of every 100 children were born or entered into a broken family. And uh, fast forward 50 years, again, uh, 12 out of 100. Uh, now we're at 60 out of 100 enter a broken family. 33 out of uh, wedlock, 27 uh, with divorced parents. And he concludes that in the space of a half of a century, America has been transformed from being a culture of belonging to a culture of, uh, of rejection. In terms of how much uh, a father can uh, have an impact, uh, data for the National Institute of Health says that uh, teenagers without a dad are twice as likely to suffer depression they are four times more likely to be expelled from school, three times more likely to repeat a grade. Drug and alcohol abuse are much more common. They also are like, much more likely to have sex before they're married, setting the stage for another fatherless generation. Uh, in terms of the American dream itself, the poverty rate for children in married couples is around 7%, according to the, the uh, NIH. By contrast, the poverty rate for children in single family, family homes is 51%. So there's uh, over half of those kids. So right now, 60% of the kids are being raised by grandparents or a single family home. Uh, and out of that 60%, half of them will remain at the, uh, at the poverty level. And uh, as we look at the Lord's Prayer and kind of pull out some uh, principles or lessons uh, for dads this morning, uh, there's just to say that there's a... Uh, uh, God's built into the family a tremendous responsibility that the dads carry, but a tremendous power as well. I, I don't have the statistic in front of me, but I, I've quoted it before from uh, Stu Weber's book, Tender Warrior, uh, and he sources it there. Uh, but for uh, what we would call evangelical Christians uh, 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 being, uh, and their kids being raised in a home where the mom is the only believer, taking them to church, praying with them, you know, there's some you know, uh, qualitative statements uh, uh, being mentioned there. Uh, all that being considered, there's about a 38% chance of those kids growing up and knowing the Lord. If there's a dad uh, in the same situation, then that figure jumps to like 78 or 80%. It's just, it's just tremendously different uh, if the dad just shows up and just uh, takes the kids to church and prays with them once in a while. Don't have to be Billy Graham. If just being there, uh, God has put a lot of power uh, and, uh, and what a, a dad can accomplish that can't be accomplished apparently without him. Which leads us to understand then strategically why Satan attacks the dads to drive them out and get them out of the home and, and, uh, uh, and break up the family. And there's a lot of pressure certainly against uh, uh, dads and raising our kids today, not only that we see in the media, but, uh, but all around us. But uh, we're going to look at the, the Lord's Prayer this morning, pretty familiar with it. I'll read a couple of the uh, introductory remarks that Jesus uh, gives to us that will help us see a couple other important lessons for uh, being a dad. And uh, this is one of those messages, unlike our normal exposition type, where we go through verse by verse and we really teach the text and then drive application 
uh, this is one where we basically read through and jump immediately to the application. So fine to do once in a while, but if I give you this kind of message all the time, you'll never learn the Bible. So that's why we, we only do it on occasion. So that's my little uh, uh, reference to that. Well, let's look, we'll read the words of Jesus, Matthew 6, 5. When you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, but you when you pray, go into your room, uh, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them. For your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The first lesson we see is in verse 5. A father must be the same in public as well as in private. Here is making reference to the hypocrites uh, and making reference to the fact that when they go out to pray, uh, they love to stand uh, in the synagogue on the corners of the streets, and it's all for the purpose of being seen by men. And he has some other things uh, to uh, certainly say about prayer. His whole point is that, is that what they're doing at home? In other words, it all seems to be like it's for show. Their life is not the same in public uh, as it is in private uh, and therefore, they live a hypocritical uh, life, and certainly that's a danger for, uh, for, uh, for dads. Uh, again, that uh, Greek word, hypocrite, uh, it means to speak through a false face, uh, and it comes from the Greek theater at that time, uh, where they would walk out into the stage, and it upon, depended upon the emotion they're trying to depict. They would wear the little mask with the happy face, and they would hold it in front of their face, and they would speak their lines through it. If they were supposed to be sad, then they would wear the other mask with the frown and they would speak through the mask. So hypocrite, someone who speaks through a false face. In other words, he's a pretender. And uh, the Pharisees in Jesus' day were the hypocrites or the pretenders. And he's saying, do not be like them. And, uh, and I can tell you that uh, this is uh, critical in raising our kids and the things that uh, our kids watch for are we the same in public as we are, are in private doesn't mean we're perfect. It uh, doesn't mean that dads don't ever do the wrong thing, lose our temper, whatever it might be. We don't pretend that nothing happened. We don't pretend that uh, somehow we're perfect. We don't pretend to be the most spiritual guy uh, on, the, on the street. In fact, there are times when we apologize to our wives, of course, but to our kids and let them know, yeah, dad's not perfect, uh, but Jesus died for our sins. He's forgiven me. I hope you'll forgive me too. Uh, it's important that they see us as genuine functioning uh, believers, the, the same in public as well as in private. Sec the second lesson is from verse 6, the father must have a personal prayer life. Seems obvious, but it says there, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in the secret place in heaven, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So pray when we're alone. Go into your room and pray. You don't need to be seen by others. There's certainly nothing wrong with public prayers, and we see them throughout the book of Acts. We see, uh, we see the, uh, the believers gathered uh, there in Jerusalem praying for Peter that he might be released. We see Jesus praying in John 6 for the food, and he says that uh, he's praying to the Father so that everybody else can hear what he has to, uh, has to say. Uh, so those are all uh, great occasions. Uh, we have uh, certainly the reference to uh, uh, Jesus uh, saying we're two or more gathered, but uh, so important that uh, we have a personal prayer life. We're not going to be able to be the same in private as we are in public if we don't uh, meet with God on a regular basis and pray to him. Uh, Peter tells us in uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, to cast all your anxiety on him uh, because he cares for you. Uh, we'd have trouble in our relationship with our wives, certainly, if the only time we talked to them was in public. <laughs> that wouldn't fly. Uh, we probably get accused of that sometimes. 
He never talks to me anymore. You know, of course, what, uh, just, uh, if you're uh, newlywed, that, that means you don't listen. Uh, she says talk, but it means listen. Your, your talking is, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And how did that make you feel? See, if you just only learn those phrases, you'll, you'll make it through the first five years of marriage, no problem. But, uh, uh, but it's important, obviously, in any relationship that we, we have some kind of ongoing conversation. Uh, and it's the same with the Lord. I don't know how you can maintain a relationship with the Lord if you're not meeting and praying on a regular basis. Again, of that two or more gathered, that's in Matthew 18, 19, Jesus says, again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Not wrong to pray in public, uh, but certainly wrong if that's the only time you're praying, uh, like, like the Pharisees. We're also to pray with a sincere heart, not just when we're alone, but it matters what we're really praying and the motivation. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now, it's kind of interesting, in fact, that Jesus gives us warning, gives a model prayer, and then people use it in vain repetition. What should I do? Pray the I, Father, 15 times. Take two aspirin, call me in the morning. You know, I, I, you know the very thing he says, don't do, people do. Uh, it, it, Jesus doesn't say, and pray exactly like this. It's a model that, uh, that we're to use, which means that when we pray, we're to pray with sincerity, not with uh, vain repetition. Uh, again, it's not wrong to pray the same thing over and over again, I've been praying for some people for 30-something years. I've been praying the same prayer for over 30 years on a pretty much a weekly basis that they would get saved, that God would open their eyes to the truth of the gospel and so forth. There's nothing wrong with praying the same thing and persisting in it. But if I'm just saying a prayer over and over and over, obviously it's, it's not from the sincerity of my heart. Uh, thirdly, we are, can use models, and certainly Jesus gives us a, a model here. I was giving one to the, the kids last night in, uh, uh, in camp, one of, uh, one of Chuck's uh, uh, classics, uh, just the idea of using your, your hand as a model. Anything, you know, how should we pray? How do I know what to pray for? What do I pray for first? Well, just uh, hold your hand up, and the thing that's closest to you is your thumb. So that's to remind you to pray for the people that are around you, that are, that are close to you, uh, for your family, for your friends, for those that uh, you uh, care dearly about. Uh, uh, the next finger is the one that points at you all the time. That's from your teacher. So pray for your teachers. Uh, it would be me, so I just thought I'd throw that in. Uh, uh, the, your other finger is the tallest one. So uh, those that are above others, those that are in authority. So we need to be praying for uh, our, our employers uh, and uh, uh, those in uh, high government positions uh, and so forth. Certainly need to be uh, praying for our, our president, and uh, we primarily want to pray that he gets saved because <laughs> he doesn't seem to like Christians very much. So we want to pray that uh, he would come to know the Lord. God would give him wisdom, uh, give him uh, wise counselors. We certainly should be praying for our Secretary of Defense, Hagel. He's making some critical decisions right now. We could go on and on praying for those in authority over us. Uh, this uh, finger actually is your weakest finger if you're uh, uh, piano player, you, you know that already. And, uh, and so pray for those that are weak, uh, those that are weak around, those that are hurting, those that are sick, those that are infirm, the things that uh, are concerning you uh, in terms of the uh, weak areas of people's lives. And then lastly, the little finger, well, that's you. And uh, so you pray for yourselves last in your own. That's a model. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is a model. Uh, people use entering the Old Testament tabernacle as, as a model. Uh, and there's lots of models. And uh, so if you're stumped in really how to sit down and have time with the Lord in prayer, uh, Jesus says, apparently, it's a good thing to use a model. Uh, and it's important to have a personal prayer life so that you can be the same in public as well as in private. Thirdly, a father's priority is for the name of God to be hallowed. That's uh, in the opening of the prayer itself, our Father in heaven hallowed be your name, or holy uh, is your name. Certainly in the Old Testament, great concern for the name of God to be set apart or holy. They uh, wouldn't pronounce it. Uh, they wouldn't write it out with uh, the verbs uh, in place so that even as you're reading it, you wouldn't be uh, thinking it in your mind. His name was to be holy. 
and uh, in the same way that apply, applies to us as dads, uh, because we reflect in our home whether God's name is holy uh, or not. Uh, it's not just that uh, we don't want people to use God's name in vain. Uh, it's what our lives are all about. And you can ask kids sometimes, as uh, one questioner did, uh, what's the most important things uh, to your dad? Uh, and they got answers like, it's how I do in sports, or it's what kind of grades uh, that, that I get. But what we would like them to say is that uh, it's his relationship with God. And, uh, and it won't be because you tell them to, to, to say that. I don't know if you know who Gail Irwin is, but uh, Gail's a good teacher, pretty funny guy, and We've had him in the church a few times, although it's been a, a few years. And on a couple of those occasions, uh, Uncle Gail stayed with us. Our kids were little. Uh, Gail's kind of a joker. So uh, uh, one of the first time uh, th things he says to our kids is we're sitting around the dinner table, uh, and I'm about ready to pray. He says, well, I have a question of your kids first. And he says, okay, uh, Josh and Melissa, what are the things that your parents uh, told you to not do or say while I'm here? <laughs> yes, that's Gail. But uh, uh, we can tell our kids certain things, but we say that basically a lot of what we want them to have uh, in their life in terms of their character and their values and their faith are much more caught than, uh, than taught. Uh, and uh, whether God's name is hallowed or holy uh, in your home uh, will be determined by, uh, as they watch you, the choices you make with your time and your money what you talk about most and what you get the most excited about. What do you, what, they'll, they'll be able to tell what's really important to you, just watching you, just listening to you, listening to your conversations. And, um, and I, I can tell you, this is when I, I didn't become a Christian until I was 28 years old, and I was on a visit uh, uh, back uh, in California with my, uh, my parents on one occasion, uh, and as I was there, I just noticed there was this radical change in my dad. Because growing up, what was important to him was the, uh, the sporting page. There was no internet. You actually had to read a newspaper to find out what was going on in those days. Uh, the sporting page would be right there, you know, right up until the, we were about ready to put food in our mouths at the dinner table. And then it had to go away. The command of my mother, of course. Uh, but uh, and what he was primarily passionate and excited, excited about was dependent on the season, of course, uh, and I'll say this for uh, Eddie's benefit, big time Oakland Raiders fan. Uh, and so that's what it was all about. I, I uh, jeopardized losing half the congregation even saying that. But uh, uh, I love all teams. I'm completely neutral. Uh, and uh, sometimes. But uh, anyway, uh, he was passionate about them. I mean, he could always tell you and uh, what was going on. And uh, actually, so was my mom. My mom could tell you the starting rotation of the A. She could tell you people's uh, batting averages. Big time fan. And uh, <laughs> I don't watch a lot of baseball. I just spent a week with them. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw all the whole. Well, sorry, A swept the Giants three out of four. But uh, saw every one, of, every pitch. You know, we're not going to. But, you know, uh, they're still, uh, you know, dad's still a big fan and all that, but not like he was. I was, I was home on this trip, and it's, uh, it's just like I actually went to my mom and said, what happened to dad? Because all he was concerned about was his Bible and reading his Bible and his Sunday school lesson, what he was teaching that way, what the Lord was doing uh, in, uh, in his, uh, his life and uh, in everything. And uh, he was so excited because uh, he had just gotten this big demotion at work which uh, allowed him to be at home more on the weekends and be involved in ministry. So he was real excited about that. There was a time he wouldn't have been real excited about that. It was promotion, not demotion, that he was excited about. Something radically changed. I said, you guys go to a Billy Graham crusade? I mean, what, what happened? You know, and I was just, and of course, my mom says, ask your father. Why don't you talk to him? Her son, a mother comment, of course. Now, what did you just tell me? You know, and... Uh, uh, but anyway, we did have that conversation, and he just told me all the great things the Lord was doing uh, in his life. But God used that, and I began to think that if God could do that and give my dad that kind of passion, maybe he could do the same for me. I didn't know yet. I didn't know yet, but I began to consider it anyway. Uh, a lot of these things are caught rather than taught. Is God's name holy you know, we kind of think, just walk around very quietly. We burn candles in the home, play uh, 12th century choir music or something. No, it's just, what are we excited about? What's the priorities uh, of, uh, of our lives? Our kids are watching. 
We need to be the same in public as well as in private. Uh, we need to have a personal prayer life with the Lord. Uh, the priority for God's name to be hallowed. And for a father provides for his children. We see that in a portion of the prayer in verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. So uh, again, it's our, in a sense, uh, we should expect our heavenly father to provide for us. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat and what you drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is life not more than food and a body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not uh, more value than they? Yeah, there's a verse you could put on your, uh, your, clo- your wife's closet right there. I just saw that. What an insight. But then she would take the other part of the verse and put it on the refrigerator. You know, so I'll probably leave that one off. She's teaching Sunday school. Uh, we'll, we'll forget that part. But uh, Jesus goes on in verse 33 uh, to say that, uh, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added or given to you as well. The things here, the food, the clothing, all these things. Uh, that we have a heavenly father that says, I will provide for you. Uh, You don't have to worry about that. Uh, But at the same time, as earthly fathers, we certainly have the responsibility to provide for our families uh, as well. And uh, and, the Bible's pretty straightforward that uh, we bear that responsibility. 1 Timothy 5.8, Paul says very sternly uh, to uh, Timothy, but if anyone does not provide for his own, his own family, and especially those of his own household, immediate family. Uh, he has denied the faith and is worse than an, un, an unbeliever. So Father's Day is a good day to thank our dads for working hard and providing uh, for us. Uh, but it's a day to remind ourselves that certainly we carry that responsibility as, as well. Uh, and the tendency, of course, is uh, to keep a balance in that. Notice that Jesus said, it's our daily bread, not our daily prime rib. You know, there's a, there, there's a balance. You know, Proverbs talks about, don't wear yourself out to become rich. It has this way of growing wings and fly, <laughs> flying away anyway. So uh, have a balance in it. Sometimes it's a struggle uh, within the home because we hear comments like, well, if you made more money, we could buy and then whatever that is. So there's a, sometimes it's, a, it's mixed messages. You know, if you just made more money and then the guy's out there working harder and longer than ever, and if you were just home a little, uh, <laughs> I can't do both of these things. Uh, and it's tough in Hawaii because uh, we live in one of the most expensive places uh, to live in the United States. And of course, according to a recent, as of last week, survey, at least in terms of tourism, Honolulu is the most expensive city to stay in. Aren't you glad that you don't stay in Honolulu and you live on the windward side? No, but they're talking about tourism. But at the same time, it's pretty expensive here. I know it's very common for guys to work, work two jobs, have an extra part-time job just to make ends meet, or both uh, are working to make ends meet. It's not for uh, extra deals, but uh, there's got to be a, a balance. Uh, our kids, though, need to see, though, so they're provided for uh, and, uh, and uh, shouldn't have the worries over that. And that dad carries that responsibility. Uh, Again, we struggle as dads because it's our tendency as men to measure our worth and identity and how much we provide for our families. And it's something we've got to really battle against. And seek first the kingdom of God. Make God and his kingdom and what you can do for his kingdom your priority. And then he'll take care of uh, the other things. I mentioned... uh, uh, my dad, for example, and being excited about a demotion uh, in everything, which uh, he, he could have taken that very, very differently after working for uh, a company for uh, 35 uh, plus, uh, plus years. And uh, a, a swing in management that decides we need a lot, lots of uh, uh, younger guys uh, on, on the scene. And uh, his attitude was, like I said, well, it's great. I won't be having to run around, fly around the country and be on the road all the time. And I won't miss any more uh, Sundays. And uh, this will be awesome. And uh, he, could have, uh, he could have stormed out of that guy's office. Interesting, his name was Mr. Bible. It's a kind of a strange little thing, twist on things there. Uh, no Bible, though. But uh, he, uh, so he storms out of his, he could have stormed out of his office. Uh, and he certainly had the sales record to bring his, uh, his lawsuit against Safeway. And, uh, but he chose not to. He just said, hey, you know what? That's fine with me. 
uh, just uh, make me the head meat cutter over here, and I want the guys, my second man, I want this gal to work for me, blah, 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 and uh, names it all out, and he decided to go over there and uh, go back in the, in the market and cut meat and make sure these were the happiest customers, and they got the best meat they've ever gotten in their life, because profit wasn't a concern, and, uh, but it, it got them home. In the process, the reason I say that, to show you how seeking first the kingdom of God and then God working, uh, as he did that, did the right thing, didn't lose his temper, trusted God in the whole thing. Uh, he's like two years away from uh, wanting to retire. In that two-year period, about eight or nine months later, uh, there was a buy-off in Safeway stock. All of his retirement is in Safeway stock. The stock splits, which means it doubled in value, which means his retirement doubled in value during that time period, and then he retired. God had a way. God had a better way. Uh, but he was seeking first the kingdom of God uh, and his righteousness. I, I can tell you about the young lieutenant commander that was uh, uh, with us for a period of time that uh, flew Tomcats back in the day, F-14s, and saw that uh, he'd be at home a little more if he uh, rolled over into a, a Navy position flying the Gulf Streams that are, that are out here. Uh, and then while he was here, he was you know, hoping to make commander and hoping this and hoping. He came to me one day and said, uh, you know, I need to talk to you because, uh, you know, I might be going crazy here, but I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking that my whole life, that's the position. I want to reach this position before I retire. And now I'm thinking, I don't really want that guy's job because he, he's gone a lot more than I am. And I've got two little kids uh, at, uh, at home. He kind of started uh, his family a, a little later uh, in life. And I said, man, Dwayne, you're not crazy. I, I, you know, just pray about it, though. See, see what the Lord has for you. And uh, it was just neat to, to see him choose not to put his name on that list and choose to see what God did. Pray through these things. I'm not, uh, this is not a, a mandate for tearing down every promotion offered your way or, or anything. But God totally worked it out for him and set him up in terms of uh, career and the future and uh, it was just awesome. And I, I just tell you one story after another after another. Uh, if we'll really take this to heart and seek first the kingdom of God uh, in his righteousness, the Lord can work. It, uh, it is a balance. It's a daily bread, not daily prime rib. Uh, we've got a responsibility. Certainly our kids shouldn't be worried. Uh, they need to see dad working, working hard. It's such a great, it's such a great model for them to see and uh, to the degree that they will grow up and be hard workers themselves will be to the degree that they see their dads out there working hard uh, each and every day. A father's got to be the same in public and in private. He's got to have a personal prayer life. There's got to be a priority uh, in the home for God's name to be hallowed, providing for his children. And five, a father pardons his children. And we see that from verse 12. As God says to us, and forgive us, or we say to him, and forgive us our debts as we forgive others. So our Heavenly Father is a pardoning Father, a forgiving Father. And we need to make sure that we're forgiving our kids and expressing that uh, to them so they know that they're forgiven. If we don't, they'll be damaged emotionally as well as spiritually. Kids just need constant uh, encouragement, constant affirmation. And I was talking to some people last night at the camp, this idea that, you know, as adults, as believers, and even though we know the word of God, we love those chapters like Romans 8 that just assure us of our God's forgiveness and that it's all by grace. Why? We constantly need to know this is really true. God has really forgiven me. I, and our kids need that as, as well. They constantly need to know that they're okay, uh, you know, even though they have disobeyed, even though there was a punishment that was met out for it, there still needs to be that reconciliation, that forgiveness that uh, welcomes them back and brings them back into the family so they don't remain, in a sense, alienated from, well, from the family. In the same way, when we sin, uh, God is still our father, but uh, we're like the prodigal son. We're alienated. There is no fellowship. Again, what brings us back is that pardon, that reconciliation, that's forgiveness. And you see a little repentance there, uh, those uh, little hearts. But uh, as soon as we see that, then we pardon them. Uh, it's important. It's uh, critical in the life of our kids. Paul gives this warning to fathers in Ephesians 6, 4, the contrast. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, uh, but bring them up in the training and admonition uh, of the Lord. 
And the idea, Paul is saying, stop doing this. He's not saying, you know, once in a while there might be a father that kind of provokes their kids. He's saying, here's the general tendency of most fathers is to do stuff that provokes their kids. And he's saying, stop it. And we, we need to hear that often. It's the little joke. It's the little whatever it is. It's not a good thing. We need to be very careful how we talk to our kids, how we address our kids. They need to be pardoned. They need to be forgiven. And certainly they need to be uh, in, uh, encouraged. And um, yeah, just from the, uh, uh, the times that I, I did youth sports and stuff, caught, uh, taught, uh, coached Pony League baseball for a number of years, I was amazed to see uh, kids come in who didn't have a role model at home. No, most of them didn't have a dad at home. And half my kids were Waimanalo, half were uh, Kailua, but it was the same uh, formula either way. It'd be 15 kids and maybe two, maybe three had a mom and dad at home, none of the others. They're all being raised by either the dad or the mom or neither by the, uh, by the grandparents. And, uh, and it was interesting. They, they needed a role model who would kind of lay down the law and give them the authority and say no because kids are dying for somebody to tell me no because uh, they actually want some authority over them. They want uh, to, uh, to, uh, to obey somebody for some reason. And, uh, but with that, then to know that, uh, be able to show them that uh, uh, you care about them, that you encourage them. And I work with them a lot. We would be like, this would be like two or three hours, uh, a couple hour practices are a little longer, four or five times a week for three and a half months. Uh, and I found if you do that for a couple seasons, it's interesting how close you can get to the kids and the relationship you can de develop with them. And it was amazing to see how they just kind of came alive. I mean, with some encouragement, it was like a flower that just o opened up and would begin to uh, bloom. And uh, uh, they, they just, uh, they need it so, so desperately. And it's such an important role for the dad to play, to create a culture of forgiveness uh, in, in the home. So father's got to be the same public and private, personal prayer life, hallowing God's name, providing and pardoning his children. And six, uh, a father protects his children. That's in verse 13. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So we, we pray to our father to protect us. Uh, and in the same way, dads have a tremendous responsibility. We have the promise from Paul that says, no tempt temptation has overtaken you except uh, as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. That's what we need to do for our kids. Uh, dads are the ones that uh, need to protect their kids, and often that uh, comes in the form of one word. It's called no. <laughs> you can add on to it. No, you can't do that, you know, but uh, that's uh, protecting. Uh, the daughter that thinks that's the guy should be dating? No, he's not the one. That's not going to actually be happening for a while. But won't it hurt her feelings? Maybe. What if she doesn't like me? That's not your concern. Get over it. If, if your goal in life is for your kids to like you, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're, you're in trouble right from the beginning. Uh, look forward to being a grandparent one day, you know, uh, you, they'll like you because you can do everything, uh, you know, you can feed them sugar and everything else and take them home, let them go crazy. Uh, you never have to discipline them. It's, it's awesome. Uh, you know, people say, oh, it's great being a grandparent. What's so great about that? It's like, I'm a grandparent. It's pretty great being a grandparent. Uh, uh, it's wonderful. But, uh, uh, that, but you don't want to be a grandparent to your kids. Uh, you don't want to be the uncle to your kids. You want to be the dad. And uh, part of that is protecting. When your 10-year-old is on a flag football team and the coach of that team thinks he's coaching an NFL team, that's when you might have to step in and say, no. Actually, that's why I got into coaching because I wasn't going to send Josh loose uh, with a bunch of other guys that their goal in life is to coach the championship team because their goal in life is to coach the all-star team because their goal in life is to show all the other coaches what a good coach they are because their goal in life is to travel to some tournament on the mainland. It's not about the kids. Uh, it's all about their goals. And I didn't want to set, not, they're not all like that, but there's a lot. It, that's, that's a predominant thing. It's, uh, it's not a good thing. And uh, I didn't want to like set him loose in that, that environment. And, and uh, you know, it's a tough crowd. I mean, I broke up fights with my, my, own, my own kids and, uh, and stuff. And uh, not, not Josh, but I would have, uh, you know, 
uh, some pretty tough kids, <laughs> and uh, I just didn't want to, so I would do damage control and stuff, and uh, uh, to be involved, uh, you've got to say no, and sometimes it's, well, no, not that way, but we'll do it this way, and uh, uh, it's important to protect your kids. Uh, I, uh, our, our kids were, I remember they uh, came home, we, we lived, um, our house is, uh, you know, Pool Hollow Village and uh, Kaneohe, and the school's right behind our house, and and our kids were like, maybe Josh was like 12, and Melissa was like 14, and they went down to the, the you know, to shoot some baskets or something, and uh, Ian came back, and they uh, remarked to us, they said, hey, that was a first. What do you mean that was a first? That's the first time we've ever been to that playground alone without you guys, 12 and 14. It never happened before. Why? The guy's drinking beer down there. The guy's over here smoking dope. All these guys are playing this filthy rap music over here, blasting it off their boom box. Oh, yeah, just send my nine-year-old daughter down. It's not going to happen. Be protective of, of your kids. How many times did our kids sleep over at someone's house except grandma and grandpa? Never, never. I mean, you, you have to use wisdom, but I'm just saying it's a different world, and it's a, it's a dad's responsibility primarily. Listen to your wife. She has a lot of sermon, but it's a dad's responsibility primarily uh, to give protection uh, for their kids. As fathers, we need to be willing to be unpopular. At times uh, in our homes, uh, our kids will, will thank us later. And uh, again, it's not an excuse to, uh, to be domineering over our kids. Certainly there's a, there's a balance. I like what uh, one writer said. said, as dads, we need to be like a policeman on the corner, <laughs> tough enough to handle any neighborhood bully, but gentle enough to hoist a child to his shoulders and help them find their way home. Another writer said, we need fathers with a lot of muscle and a lot of restraint. We need both. It's kind of the, the tough love, but uh, big emphasis on, on the love uh, as well. Every earthly father certainly will fall short in some way, shape, or manner, uh, but we certainly have a loving Heavenly Father uh, that, uh, that gives us a model and will teach us uh, how to be good dads. Uh, not everybody in the media is proclaiming the, how great it is to not have a dad. And I just wanted to uh, <laughs> read a couple of quotes from a New Yorker article of a year ago with uh, Bruce Springsteen. He was talking about how dysfunctional his own home was and how over the years he's actually written songs about his uh, broken relationship with his uh, with dad. One of them was called Adam Raised a Cane, uh, where the lyrics say, uh, walk these empty rooms looking for someone to blame. You inherit the sins. You inherit the flames. And he says that that was all about my relationship with my dad. In the article, he went on and said, my dad was, not, was very nonverbal. You couldn't really have a conversation with him. Uh, I had to make my peace with that, but I had to have a conversation with him because I needed to have one. It ain't the best way to go about it, but that was the only way I could, so I did. And eventually he did respond. He might not have liked the songs, but I think he liked that they existed and meant that he mattered. And uh, he said that he admitted there was always a yearning for what he just simply called daddy. Uh, and he said that my parents' struggles is the subject of my life. It's the thing that eats at me and always will. Those wounds stay with you and you turn them into a language uh, and into a purpose. Uh, not everybody in the media is saying that you don't need a dad. I mean, there's some, some, some people like this so that will reflect the reality of how critical and how important it is. And uh, again, we have a loving Heavenly Father. Whether we had brokenness in the past or a great dad, uh, doesn't, uh, however it was in the past, is no reflection of how it can be in the, in the future uh, because God's got a plan and if we follow it, uh, it'll be a blessing. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever-living He lives to silence all my fears. He lives to wipe away my tears. 
He lives to calm my troubled heart. He lives all blessings to impart. He lives all blessings to impart. He lives to give me daily bread. He lives and I shall conquer death. He lives, and while I live, I'll sing. He lives, my prophet, priest, and king. He lives, my prophet, priest, and king. He lives, triumphant. He lives eternally to save. And what joy this blessed assurance gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. What comfort this sweet sentence gives. He lives, he lives, who once was dead. He lives, my ever living man. He lives triumphant from the grave. He lives triumphant from the grave. He lives eternally to save. And what joy this blessed assurance gives. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my Redeemer lives. When we stand together, Lord, we give you our hearts this morning. As our Father, Lord, you've always come to us. You've always saved us in the nick of time. You've always brought us to you. You've always opened our eyes so we could see you. So Lord, we just give you our hearts again as children to our Father. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, for saving us, for choosing us. And we just want to offer our lives all over again to you. Thank you, Lord. Put your hands together. Lord, you never let me go. You never left me alone. While I was wandering the back road. You prepared for me a home. You opened up my prison doors. You gave me wings to you so I could soar. Picked up the pieces of my brokenness. You wrapped me in your arms of tenderness. Oh, I can't ignore. I can't turn away. Your great love holds my heart your great love 
Your great love holds my heart. Dreams and hopes and visions. From the wasteland comes a song. More than something to believe in. More than someone to become. Bloom the flowers of compassion. Rain down the showers, bring us tears of joy. Raising voices and exultations. Raise a symphony of joyful noise. Oh, I can't ignore. I can't turn away. Your great love holds my heart. Your great love. Your great love holds my heart. Your great love holds my heart. Your great love. Your great love holds my heart. Higher than the highest mountains, clearer than the blue skies. Deeper than eternal fountains, perfect love that never dies. Capture the power of our passions, open the heavens to our open eyes. We will proclaim before the nations, perfect love that never dies. Oh, I can't ignore, I can't turn away. my heart. Your great love, your great love holds my heart. Your great love holds my heart. Your great love, your great love holds my heart. Higher than the highest mountains, clearer than the blue skies, deeper than eternal fountains, perfect love that never dies, perfect love that never dies, perfect love that never dies. God bless you. Jesus. Lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, I will never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend, I will worship you until the very end. Jesus, lover of my soul, Jesus, I will never let you go. You've taken me from the miry clay. You set my feet upon the rock, and now I know I love you. I need you, though my world may fall, I will never let you go. You're my Savior, my close friend, and I will worship you until the very end. 
till the very end till the very end that you crack the sky Lord Jesus and you come again till the very end Till the very end, to you crack the sky, Lord Jesus, and you come again. I love you, I need you. Though my world may fall, I will never let you go. My Savior, my closest friend. I will worship you until the very end. And I will worship you until the very end. I will worship you until the very end. I will worship you until the very end. I stand alone In the congregation Only unto you You have my full attention Lord, in my cry Deal with my heart From the deep to the sky You fill it all in my cry I present myself You see in all dimensions All my sickness and health You know my full intention Now where and why all in your full view let me be filled with your life in the likeness of you in you i trust your love overcomes the dust of men the weakness in us you will defend the accusation against our selfishness, our guiltiness. In you I trust the blood that was spent, the hope placed in us to raise us all up again. You will uphold, you will not forsake you have prepared us a place and you I trust you I I will rest in you Secure in your protection Though my days are few I trust in your redemption So I'll sing to you 
give substance to my voice and all the days of my life I will never be moved in you I trust your love overcomes the dust of men the weakness in us you will be fed the accusation against our selfishness, our guiltiness. And you I trust the blood that was spent, the whole place in us to raise us all up again. You will uphold, you will not forsake. You have prepared us a place in you I trust. In you I trust. In Welcomed in to the courts of a king, I've been ushered in to your presence. Lord, I stand on your merciful crown, yet with every step tread with reverence. And I'll fall As your glory shines around, it's all fall face down. As your glory shines around, who is there in the heavens like you and upon the earth? Who's your equal? You are far above. You're the highest of heights. We are bowing down to exalt you. And I'll fall face down as you go. Oh